Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is Alan. A starship is like a complex organism, and it all starts in the nerve center or the bridge of the ship. This is where the senior officers and captain relay commands to all of the other crews who, like cells, make sure each of the important systems within the ship are running at optimal performance. A ship without a bridge lacks sentience. Its organs might still be able to function, but without coordination and higher purpose. So how a faction or individual designs a bridge says quite a lot about their personality, goals, and culture. Today we'll be looking at seven unique starship bridge designs which I believe are amongst the best in science fiction. Very few ships can match the grandeur and imposing feel of dominance that just oozes from an Imperial Star Destroyer at the height of the Galactic Empire. For more than two decades, the Galactic Navy was driven by rampant militarism and a need to save the galaxy's soul by wiping out all of the lesser alien races. What resulted were some of the most terrifying, yet beautiful warships the galaxy had ever seen. The Imperial Class Star Destroyer was very much the backbone of the Imperial Navy, and the Executor Class Star Dreadnought was a spear that the Great Emperor would plunge into the heart of the Rebellion. Like any fascist regime with heavy nationalistic tendencies and a strong central government, the ships the Empire made were like propaganda tools themselves. Far too big for the job and far too imposing to be properly used for peacekeeping. And the bridges of these ships reflected those qualities as well. The Imperial Class Star Destroyer and the Executive Class Star Dreadnought both featured elevated bridges that stuck out from the rest of the ship. These were great towers from which the Empire's elite would look down on the rest of the ship. Even inside the bridge itself, the officers would walk around on catwalks while the junior officers would keep their heads down in the pits, controlling the weapon systems, navigation, comms, and so on. But this was a very visual reinforcement of the Empire's strict hierarchy. These imposing bridges were designed to inspire awe from the soldiers of the Empire and also the civilian population, but they were also prime targets for enemy forces. Ultimately, the raised bridge design would be a huge problem for the Empire and lead to several disasters throughout the Galactic Civil War. The First Order, which grew out of the Empire's destruction, was heavily focused on learning from the Empire's mistake. So when they designed the Resurgent Glass Star Dreadnought, they kept the grand bridge design with its large romantic viewports overlooking the prow of the ship. But they also made sure to heavily reinforce that bridge with additional armored plating, point defense weapons, and its own dedicated shield generator. The bridge was also slightly off-centered and much lower to the body of the ship when compared to the Imperial variants. There was also a backup bridge placed deep within the hold of the Star Dreadnought in case anything happened to the main bridge. So in a way, the Resurgent Class Star Dreadnought offered the best of both worlds, a calculated mixture of romance and function. Hey guys, British Ben here, and the bridge of the USS Enterprise NCC-1701D from Star Trek was a luxurious affair. It was more like the inside of a Tesla than the bridge of a spacefaring vessel, and that was kind of the whole point of the Galaxy class. A ship that was designed to stay out in space indefinitely, they valued comfort. People had to be happy living on the ship for years. But in practical terms, the bridge of the Enterprise-D was also very advanced. First of all, the bridge module could be swapped out and replaced. So the bridge that you see on screen in the series is actually the second bridge the ship had. The first bridge module that was used during testing of the ship was removed. Then, everything on the bridge of the Enterprise-D was touch screen. So even though each station had a name, for example, these stations here are Science 1, Science 2, Mission Operations, Environment and Engineering, for example, they could actually be reconfigured to serve any purpose. The bridge of the Enterprise-D also had independent life support systems from the rest of the ship. So it could actually maintain M-class planet atmospheric conditions like Earth for up to 72 hours, even if both the primary and secondary life support systems on the rest of the ship had failed. The bridge also had multiple turbo lift shafts, each with backup turbo lift cars so the crew could easily access any important location on the ship, as well as an emergency express turbo lift that went directly to the battle bridge. To the side of the bridge was Picard's ready room. Basically, it was Picard's office, which he was very possessive over. Jean-Luc, it's wonderful to see you again. How about a big hug? Get out of my chair! And behind the bridge was the observation lounge. 
Kind of like the boardroom of the Enterprise, where Captain Picard liked to play practical jokes on the crew. I am, uh, stuck. Then get unstuck and continue with the briefing. And yes, there were a couple of restrooms. You gotta go, you gotta go. And there were also two food replicators in the bridge module, so the night shift could pig out on some wings and drinks and watch some classic 20th century movies on the main viewer. And talking of viewers, now for a bridge that gives you a much better view of everything. In the alien universe, humanity luckily doesn't have to deal with many alien warships. Instead, the threats are much more mundane, like cosmic radiation, microasteroids, turbulent atmospheric storms, and of course, genetically modified killer aliens. The USCSS Prometheus is one of the earliest exploration ships utilized by humanity. It's primarily designed for civilian uses, so it doesn't feature much in the form of defenses, but it did have one of the first FTL drives equipped on human ships, making it quite revolutionary. From a size standpoint, it was a lot smaller than freight haulers like the USCSS Sulaco, and therefore designed for making landfall even in the most treacherous environments, which is why the Prometheus has an excuse for having a massive forward cockpit pit with a beautiful view of the surrounding environment, including a very generous view of the ground and landing struts. As convenient as remote cameras are, nothing beats a view with your naked eyes when you're exploring a brand new planet. Our next bridge might not be all that romantic or visually interesting, but it's probably one of the better designed ones and the only one that really makes sense on this entire list. We of course are talking about the Battlestar Galactica's bridge. The bridge or combat information center in this ship is one gigantic room located in the center of the ship behind several layers of bulkhead and armor. Given the dangers of flying in space in what essentially is a pressurized tin can, it makes a lot of sense to make your command center as protected as possible. And since real spaceflight takes place in massive open areas and requires more mathematical calculations than visually aided flying, there are massive banks of computers and navigational equipment where the viewports would normally be. As a matter of fact, the entire combat information center doesn't have any windows at all. In situations where the crew would need a direct external view of the ship, they would just rely on cameras. The only strange thing about the Battlestar Galactica Bridge is the fact that everyone seems to be standing. There literally are no crash chairs or restraints anywhere to be found. Sometimes you don't have to sacrifice beauty just to make something functional. The Normandy SR-1 and the Cerebrus upgraded SR-2 are a great example of human engineering combined with beautiful human aesthetics. The bridge in this ship maintains that beautiful forward viewport that we all would love to have in our ship and also a more protected area for the command crew. The Normandy does this by separating the cockpit from the CIC. In the center of the ship is the command deck. This is where all the crew sits at their system consoles and where the commander can view the navigational map. This area of the ship can be sealed off completely with bulkhead doors and has no viewports. Then at the front of the ship is the cockpit which has your more traditional airplane style windscreen. The pilot and the artificial intelligence co-pilot can be isolated at the front of the ship in case other areas are damaged. Overall, this ship is an elegant compromise between form and function. Oh yeah, Beltaloda, it's American Ben, just taking some time out for my research into the protomolecule because Alan requested that I discuss the bridge of the Rosinante, the iconic ship from The Expanse. By the way, Alan, I know it's been a long time since I've seen you due to this whole pandemic thing, but I just want to take the time now to say congratulations on the new baby. Anyway, to be honest, the term bridge is a little bit of a misnomer for the Rosinante because when you think of a bridge, you think of a central location from which a ship can be commanded. But given how integrated the Rosinante systems are, it wouldn't be too difficult to command the ship from even the med bay if need be. That said, the Rosinante does have a bridge-like section that's made up of a flight deck and a command deck. However, this is in some area of the ship where the crew stands around peering out into the blackness of space ahead. You see, the Rosinante needs to be thought of in more of a vertical sense than a horizontal sense. It's built like a narrow building with floors stacked on top of one another. As I explained on the video I did on the ship the other day, if the Rosinante were on Earth and stood up vertically, and you walked inside of it, everything would be oriented normally. The Expanse's creators devised the ship this way because in space, when free falling into darkness, with the only extant force being some semblance of microgravity, directions lose most of their value. Thus, spaceships don't need to be horizontally focused like airplanes. 
And therefore, the flight deck on the Rosinante, which houses the pilot and co-pilot, has no window from which to look out onto, pardon the pun, expanse. Actually, if we are using Earth-based terminology, the pilot would be staring into what we would consider the floor of the ship. But he has a giant HD screen in front of him that's integrated with all the ship's systems, that he can operate from a tablet connected to his seat, and which helps him to guide the ship far better than any window could. And now I'm going to get angry comments from the window lobby. Anyway, just down the stairs from the flight deck is the also windowless command deck, within which the rest of the crew sits, and which also uses screens and tablets integrated with the ship's systems to guide the ship and operate all of the ship's features. All of the seats can rotate and lean on an axis in order to adjust to the ship's orientation, and they have strong belts that can hold crew members in place during high G burns, or when drinking coffee, which if you know anything about space in the Expanse's universe, you know that nothing works without coffee. The Rosinante's bridge is awesome, and it belongs on this list, but not because it's the most epic bridge you'll ever see, but because it makes sense and it's an intelligently built bridge that, like the rest of the ship, can best be described as intuitive. There's a meeting table at the center of the command deck, which the crew often stands around to discuss missions. From this table, the crew can once again operate all the ship's features, whether following along with the crew on EVA missions, firing point defense cannons, or playing around with its interactive 3D map technology. Obviously, as the Rosinante's bridge isn't exposed to external enemies, it's hard to target. But given that the overall ship is only 46 meters long, I can't claim that its bridge is nestled safely away from incoming fire, but it has plenty of other capabilities that keep it protected beyond its bridge. And you can check out the full video we did on the Rosinante if you want to learn more about such features. Now back to Al. We talk a lot in this video about properly designing a bridge that can be secured from enemy attack and really give your crew optimal protection. Now, it's something that unfortunately a lot of sci-fi writers seem to forget, but uh, in Star Wars at least, there's one ship that I think is a great example of a good bridge design. And it comes to no surprise that such a ship was designed by the cowardly businessmen of the Trade Federation. The Trade Federation was the logistics company that made their money on the hyperspace lines traveling from the deep core of the galaxy to the Outer Rim. Due to a lack of Republic law enforcement in the Outer Rim, the Trade Federation was forced to refit several of their transport ships with weapons. It's much cheaper than buying a dedicated warship, which won't be able to haul any freight in the first place. The Trade Federation was all about cost-cutting measures. They also utilized the huge droid labor force, and sentients usually served as officers or leaders in their organization and were well protected from any kind of danger they might see. The Lucre Hulk class battleship started its life as an enormous cargo hauler. Just like here on Earth, the largest vessels in Star Wars are either designed for the military or for cargo transportation. The Lucre Hulk was shaped like a donut and more than three kilometers in diameter. Its entire hull was designed to transport freight, and now it was converted to haul millions of droids and other war material. The hull was also covered in turbo lasers, point defense weapons, and deflector shields. At the center of the Luker Hulk was an almost Death Star-like mini-sphere. This was actually the command module of the ship and where the bridge and most of the sentient crew would be stationed. Not only was this area protected by the cargo hold and all the weapons and deflector shields, the sensor also had its own generator and reactors, and it had its own propulsion system. Which means if the ship is heavily damaged, the command module can disconnect and serve as a massive escape pod. So there you have it guys, uh, those are some of the best bridges in science fiction according to us. It was great seeing American Ben and British Ben, even though we're all isolated from one another and haven't really seen each other physically, through the power of the internet and blood magic, we were able to come together in this video, which is really nice. Hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that life is a movie and you are the protagonist.